So I'm going to talk about how family businesses are types of businesses that people should look at emulating for their corporations rather than looking at how Intel and Microsoft and Walmart and all these large corporations work, we should really be looking at how small family businesses actually operate because they're the ones that have been around for the longest and there's obviously a reason for that. Um, and it's not something we really research or look into or talk about very much. So family businesses are all over the place. Um, they're not really something that you think about because essentially they're a type of company that wants to be small and nimble. They're not really looking to take over the world or make a name for themselves. Really their main motivation is to make sure that they have a lifestyle business, something that can last for generations. All the children can make sure they have a comfortable life. And that, that's really all they're looking for, right? So it's not really something that we look into or or you know talk about very much there's not many articles written about it or anything like that um, the reason is most of these families right like they're they're doing their thing and when people go to get their masters in business at places like harvard and oxford and all these large uh, universities when you have these case studies that you have to look at they're not looking at small family businesses, right? You're looking at how did Walmart come to be? How did Intel become a corporation? How did Costco, how did Ikea, all these large businesses, those are the things that you're studying when you're trying to get your master's in business, right? They're teaching you how to grow into a large corporation that's a worldwide institution, right? That you have places in the US, Europe, South America, Australia, everywhere, right? How do you run a company that consists of thousands upon hundreds of thousands of that's the interesting thing to these people, or at least that's what they think is interesting, right? So they want to teach you how to run those type of businesses. They don't really care about the small businesses that, to, and to be honest, are the ones that have been running a lot longer, right? If you look at IKEA, if you look at Intel or IBM, I know some of them have been around for hundreds of years, but they haven't been around for centuries, right? A lot of family businesses have lived for 300 plus years. And no one really thinks about that, right? And those are the corporations that we should be looking into because you know it's very difficult to last for 300 years, right? It's not a very easy thing to do. I don't, I don't believe a lot of the companies that are in the tech world right now, like Google and Apple. I mean, at least to me, I don't think they can last 300 years. I don't know how they're going to do it, but then again, maybe I'm just a very pessimistic person. Um, so if you look, if you look at the large corporations, Wells Fargo, they have these things what they call like labs and research institutions. And basically what those tend to be are very small groups of people that the large corporation have, has given the ability to basically do what they want, right? They can run their team the way they want to run it. They can figure out the types of tools that they want to use. You know, do they want to be an agile shop? Do they want to be a scrum shop? Kanban, all these, all these buzzwords that we keep hearing about, that's what these labs are having the ability to do, right? They don't have to necessarily operate the same way that the rest of the company does, right? And the idea being that if these small groups can find a better way of doing things, then hopefully the large corporation starts adopting that back in. But in reality, a lot of these large companies, I mean, look at Walmart, for example, right? It's a huge company, but the fact was, when Sam Walton started it, it was, it was just a family business, right? So they had certain values and philosophies back then, and for you know various reasons over time when the company became a lot larger, they've forgotten those values and philosophies, or it wasn't as instilled as maybe they thought back then compared to right now. So, in, you know, these Kanban and these scrum things, they're, at least to me, essentially buzzwords for doing things a way that a lot of people already know how to do, right? Like, when these family businesses run, they're very agile, right? Like, they're not really thinking about very structured ways of doing things or, like, making sure that, like, their manager and their managers' managers are, are, like, you know, saying it's okay for you to do something, right? The way a family business works is that 
you know, you're there because you're trying to make sure that the family makes money or the family does well. And whatever you're going to do, everybody trusts you that you're doing it for the benefit of the business, that you're not trying to do something just for yourself or you're doing something that might derail the company, right? And those are, those are the things that we forget about when corporations grow very big. There's very, like, you know, rules and restrictions and policies in place to prevent certain things from happening. And the idea being is that you don't have very much trust within each other, and, and that's kind of a problem. So, like I said, you know, Harvard and Oxford aren't really writing case studies about these. So there isn't very much information out there for us to really even go read, right? Few journalists are writing articles, you know, there aren't case studies, universities aren't really talking about it. You might be able to, you know, if you if you find a family business, you could go talk to them yourselves. There's nothing for you to kind of digest in in an info like in an easy way, right? You can't go read a book about how to do this. There might be a few out there, but they're not very popular, nothing that people are talking about. So you know who are who are Walmart, Microsoft, all these people trying to emulate, right? If they're not, if they don't think family businesses are important and they're running these labs and research groups, then what are the companies that they're trying to emulate? And, that, and from what it seems like, you know, they're, they're trying to emulate the startups of the world, right? Or, or some of the startups that have become successful like Valve and GitHub and, and Gore-Tec, the people that make like all the cool um, outerwear for athletes. And the fact is, you know, they're looking at these companies because you know, their, their, the ambition of these companies are to become, you know, large and act, they're actually in the limelight. So obviously, obviously these large corporations are looking at them. But in reality, those, those companies are really essentially just emulating aspects of a family business that they feel can benefit their own corporation, right? So we should really be looking at the source rather than like other companies that are just essentially emulating the source. Um, when I was doing some of my research on trying to make this talk, I found an article from The Guardian about this company that is, a, is essentially a family bakery in the UK. They're, at the time of the article, the fifth generation was running the corporation. And over the years, it actually has become the second largest brand in the United Kingdom. The only one bigger than it is Coca-Cola, which to me is a, is a pretty big thing to say. Um, but the, the fact was that they were actually able to get past what some people call the third generation hump. Essentially what that means is the first generation is kind of like, they're kind of the founders, right? They, they created the company, it was very interesting to them, they had passion, they had drive, they wanted to turn something from nothing into something. And then the second generation, you know, they were the children of the first generation, so they were able to kind of see their parents bring this company from very little to, to where it is now. So they're, they were also very driven. They were fortunate that they had some money in the bank to even bring the company a little farther. Um, but what tends to happen to a lot of family businesses is that in the third generation, those people kind of get a little bit arrogant that they're, they're essentially like, wow, we have, we have some money now. I didn't really have to do anything to get this money. The company is going really well. I'm just going to go and buy all the drugs and all the cars and basically just run this to the ground and not really care because it's not my problem anymore, right? Um, and and those are, it's very hard to get around that, right? Like when the parents kind of retire, you know, they're relying on their children to run the company how they want it to. And if they're not, there's not much they can do about it, right? It's, not, it's no longer their problem. So getting over that third generation hump, those are the companies that really last for a long time. Um, so the, the interesting part about Warburton's was when they got, when the fifth generation took over, um, the company was actually in somewhat of a mess. What happened was the third generation and the fourth generation, they, they wanted to try to, they were trying to expand the company. To them, they felt that was the, the right way to grow the company. And so they were trying to dive into other areas than just making um, and it wasn't going very well, right? Those areas weren't prospering as much as the bakery did. So the fifth generation kind of had a choice, right? They could have easily just decided that, you know, we're, we're no longer going to do this. We're just going to sell everything off, take the money, and, you know, live our life however we want. Um, but the fact was, you know, they, they cared about the company. It was something that mattered to them. And what they did was they, they kind of sat down and realized that the thing that they cared about, the part of the business that they really enjoyed, 
was the bakery. So they, they got rid, they kind of sold off the other various aspects of the business that the previous generations were trying to, you know, go into and just focus on the bakery. And, you know, over the, fourth, over the fifth generation, they were the ones that brought the company to the point that they're now the second largest brand in the United Kingdom. A, another company that I found very interesting is actually Beretta. Um, they're, I believe, the oldest company in the world. They started in 1526, so about 500 plus years now. And the interesting part about them is the other companies in their industry, like Remington, over the years they got bought out by conglomerates and you know taken over. But Beretta, essentially to this day, still is run by the Beretta family. Um, over the years, it was actually always passed down from father to son, but Scott actually told me today that um, this is the first time that it's not gonna be that way, and the only reason is is that the person, the father running it right now, doesn't actually have a son to pass it along to, so one of the sisters has a son, and so that, that's who it's gonna get passed to. But it's still run by the Brenna family. And that, that to me is pretty amazing. I mean, they started off in the 15th century creating like very, you know, like, okay guns. They're, they're, they were selling it to like, you know, people for war and stuff like that. But what they realized that was interesting was that um, they, the reason they started the company was that the Beretta family was very much into hunting. Um, that, that was their passion. That's what they enjoyed doing. So they, they felt like, okay, why don't we make guns for our passion? And then the other people that enjoy hunting will hopefully find our guns very useful and, and buy it as well. And what they what they realized the benefit for them was that these other individuals who were hunting were also happy to be a part of the military and, and other organizations that needed uh, weaponry. So you know when they when they join the military, I feel like my microphone is very off. Is it, is it that one? Yeah, no worries. Hello? Alright, this is a little bit better. So yeah, they were they were focused on the hunting industry, and that that's because that's what they cared about. Um, and they knew that essentially, right? When you, when you start in the 15th century, you see a lot of things happen, um, a lot of wars, and a lot of and the fact that they realized was wars come and go. But the fact is, like the sport of hunting is always going to be around, right? People are going to enjoy going to hunt deer and other various animals, and so focusing on that was going to benefit their company. So they spend a lot of their marketing efforts in the hunting industry rather than trying to sell to militaries and, and countries. They knew that like if they had the best gun, those people were gonna to come to them. And, and that's what happened over time. So Franco was one of the, early, the Beretta brothers in the, in the early years. And he oversees the manufacturing of the guns and marketing. He was the one that realized that they should focus more on the hunting. Um, but when he was 16, his father, who was the CEO of the company, um, had him do an apprenticeship uh, with the chief engineer at the time. Um, and, the, and essentially what, what he realized from working for this chief engineer was that the reason all these people enjoyed working there was that the Beretta family treated them like family. You know, they trusted their engineers to do the best job possible and that if they were going to try to do something that was questionable or you know innovative that they were going to put faith and trust into them because they knew that they enjoyed what they were going to do and eventually you know the movements that they were going to make with the new guns and the new weaponry was going to benefit the company as a whole and they should encourage that rather than restrict their engineers from doing that and forcing them to do things that you know they knew were tried and true were going to make them money 
because the fact is they realize that if they want to continue existing for so many generations, they're going to have to take some risks and they're going to have to trust their employees to do things that they weren't very comfortable about because maybe when they were running the company or when they were the engineers, you know, that wasn't something that was like even feasible to do, right? So it was scary to them or risky to them. But that's, you know, when you're a big company, you know, you worry about, oh, we don't need to take risk anymore. But the fact is those risks are gonna help you succeed uh, throughout the generations because the fact is not everything is gonna move on from decade to decade, right? Like things that maybe make sense in one decade don't make sense in another. You know, that's why we're not wearing bell bottoms and all that stuff now. Those are things that really make sense for this decade like they did in the, in the 60s and 70s. Something that I feel that, you know, these, these families do accomplish very well over the generations is that early on they set up values and philosophies that they feel are going to grow the company and are going to grow the business. Now, to be fair, you know, a lot of people, the way they look at it, they're like, oh, these values and philosophies are set in stone, right? They're like the Ten Commandments. Like, once they're written down, they can never be changed forever because that's what the founding members decided upon. But that, that's, not, that's not how values and philosophies should be looked at. The fact is, like, you know, these are what the founders felt at the time was important. And you should think about that when it's your generation's time to take over. But if they need to be adopted, they can, right? They're not something that's set in stone. But it's something that you should be thinking about and making sure it's being instilled in the company because those are the things that are going to allow the previous generations to understand how the business should be run, right? Like if one of your philosophies is to take risks, is to look into innovation, innovative things that maybe might make you feel uncomfortable, then when a previous generation takes over, you know, they're going to know that, okay, like, this is something that's important to the company. Like, it's known for us to look into these risky endeavors because we know that it's possible that if we, if we follow these things, that they're going to benefit the company rather than, you know, avoiding them and trying to stick to the things that we know are going well. So what I think essentially are the, are the things that we can take from family businesses are the fact that people are the most important thing. You know, if you have the right people working for you, if these are people that you care about, you trust, you respect, um, no matter what you're gonna do, you're gonna be able to have a successful business. Um, having core values, something for people to actually look at and be like, this is how we're supposed to treat each other. This is how we're supposed to, you know, figure out how to create new products. This is, this is how, you know, we run a company. Those are things that are going to benefit a, a corporation because when you bring new members on, they need to have something to, you know, be able to follow, right? Because otherwise they're just going to make their own values and philosophies up. And, you know, you're, you're going to hope that they, that they follow the ones that the company has, but if you have values that you can instill upon them, it's going to make things a lot easier for everybody. And the other aspect is you need to really enjoy what you're working on, right? If you're if you're working at a company and all it is to you is a paycheck, then the fact is that doesn't benefit the business as much as it doesn't benefit you, right? Because all you're going to really do is you know do what's asked of you, and that's it. You're not going to try to grow the company, you're not going to try to make it better, you're not going to try to create new products that you think are going to, you know, bring more business to the company. So I'm Donish Khan, I live in the city of San Francisco, and I work for a sticker and t-shirt company called Gideon. So I, I want to go over a little bit about um, people, right? Like I said, I believe people are some of the most important parts of a business, and families they kind of they kind of have the best part of this, right? Because the people they work with are people that are related to them by blood. Now, to be fair, maybe you don't really enjoy working with your brother or your sister or your mom or your dad, but there is still, no matter what, a sense of trust and respect that you have for these people, kind of because you have to. Um, but you know, the other thing people forget is that you don't necessarily have to have. Um, your family be the people that are related to you by blood, right? They can be, they can really be anybody. Um, I'm actually the only child, so I don't really have any brothers or sisters. But to me, my family are the friends that I, I've, you know, gotten in high school, in college, when I was in grade school, you know, those people, to me, are my family. They've been around 
you know, for years in my life, they've been very important to me. So, you know, the, like the fact is you don't necessarily have to think of family as just the people that happen to, you know, be born and, and have the same mother and father as you do. Um, you know, friend, friends are all over the place. I have friends, you know, in, in the States, friends out here, friends everywhere, and, and they're the ones that have shaped me. Like, without them, I don't really think I would be where I am today. Um, so the, the interesting thing is a lot of people, when they think of corporations, they think of this structure, right? They think of a, a hierarchical structure. When they think of a hierarchical structure, they think that you know their their boss is going to be the guy that that gives them TPS reports that they have to write, or their boss is going to be the person that you know has no idea what they're talking about when they're trying to be like, oh, like we have to be an agile shop, we have to do test driven development. These are the things that are going to make us a better shop. The the boss would be like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Like waterfall, waterfall, waterfall. Like just do that. Um, and then when they when you think of like interesting startups that are running in a cool way, you think that they're like a flat hierarchy, or you know some of them like Valve or just the founder, and then everybody under them. Um, some companies like Spotify actually try to operate in like a little in a mesh type of organization, right? Where like each group or each node has their leader and then there's like a VP above that. There's all these various ways you can structure an organization. But the fact is the structure doesn't mean anything, right? Like the structure is in place because the more you grow, um, it's beneficial to have a structure, right? Like when you're a five person company, a 20 person company, it's, it's easy for everybody to understand what's going on, right? Like I can go talk to a individual and basically talk to all 10 employees and understand what they're working on. But when you're 200, when you're 500, when you're 1,000, you know, that, that's basically impossible. For me to understand what's going on in the entire company, that, like, that's basically a job in itself, right? And so that's why sometimes structure needs to be put in place. There needs to be people whose job it is to, is to make sure that People are working on the right things that need to be worked on. People are communicating with the right people in the organizations, right? When a new product's being made, the product team, the marketing team, the sales team, various teams need to work together to make sure that the launch of the product actually is successful. And if you don't have people whose jobs are to make sure all those communications occur, all those things happen the right way, like it, it might not go very well. So the, the way I like to look at it is that you know, it's not the structure, it's the people. You know, you can have a box or you can have a leader. And, and I like to think, you know, the, the family businesses and the corporations that are running in a good way, they, they have leaders, they don't have bosses, right? Now, obviously, you know, you might be arguing it's semantics, they're all still managers, but you know, your manager doesn't have to be someone that tells you what to do. Your manager should be someone whose job, their job should be making sure you do your job well. Right? They're supposed to come and ask you, oh, how are things going? You know, are you enjoying what you're working on? Oh, you're not enjoying what you're working on. Let's try to figure out what, what you can work on that excites you, that, that helps you grow your career, that, you know, that makes you want to work at this company. That's what a manager's job should be, right? They shouldn't be just telling you that you need to do this, and if you don't, you're going to be fired. And also a leader, you know, if it's possible, is someone that's been in the trenches with you as well. You know, having the first engineer who created the product then become the VP of engineering, you're going to have a sense of respect for that individual, right? Like, just because they're the manager, you know that without them, you know, the company wouldn't be around. And you know that, like, they've essentially been working on the code base from the beginning. So they're going to have some insight um, that, you, that you don't, right? So you might make a suggestion and they might disagree with you, and you should listen to them because they have more experience with the code base than you do. And it's not, it's not that they're trying to tell you that you're wrong, they're just trying to give you an aspect that maybe you weren't aware of, right? Like two years ago, they might have thought about doing, like changing the product in the way that you suggested now, and it was a bad idea then, and they might have some insight about that. So the, the thing that I personally think is the most important is really hiring. Right? Like, because if you focus and do a really good job with hiring the right individuals, then everything else hopefully should come in line, right? Like, you should have a good engineering team that writes good code. You should have um, an ops team that works together that isn't bitching at each other about who's gonna, like, you know, be on pager duty 
that weekend. Like all those things will align well because if you hire the right people, those people are gonna trust each other, they're gonna respect each other, and they're gonna actually enjoy working with each other. Now to be fair, you know, I'm not saying that like there are problems with family businesses, right? Like every everything has a problem. I know with family businesses and at least with Ditto, who, who tries to at least adopt some of these, it's very difficult sometimes for you to find your way in the company when you start off, especially if you're part of the engineering team. Our engineering team is about 150 engineers, and it, it can be very overwhelming. You might be hired to be a Rails developer, but the fact is, like, we have GitHub.com, that's a Rails product. We have a bunch of internal tools, that's a Rails product, and you might just be super overwhelmed as well as super excited about like, oh man, I want to work on everything. All of this is really cool. And then you realize three or four months down the line that like, you haven't really been focusing on anything. You've kind of just been dabbling around on stuff and maybe fixing anything. And you might not feel like you're really contributing back to the company. So that, that's kind of a difficult thing to do. And I know for us, it's something we're working on, right? Is that like some people need to just be like sat down and, and tell them that like, okay, like, I know you're a Rails developer, but like, you need to focus on one product, right? You need to focus on a project that you find industry interesting, or at least the most interesting compared to all the other stuff, and, and really try to contribute to it and, and make it better or introduce some features that might benefit our customers in some way. Another problem that we have is, is mentoring. So when, at least for us, when we hire people, the idea is like, we wanna hire the best person for the job. So when you, when you think about mentoring, you normally think about hiring an intern or a junior developer that then has a senior developer that's kind of helping them grow as an engineer. But it, it's been very difficult for us because it's not something that's been part of our culture because everybody is kind of told that like, it's your job to figure out what to do and you should be the best at what you do. So having something like a mentoring program you know, we've realized now is, is something that might benefit the company. You know, we don't, you know, obviously, like, sooner or later, we're just going to hire all the best people. And I mean, what are we going to do then, right? Um, so getting getting junior developers and being able to mentor them is something that, you know, a lot, of, a lot of companies need to have, right? Especially when you get to the hundreds of thousands of people, you're, you're going to want to put some investment and some time into these people and help them grow. So that, that's something, at least for us, I know we're trying to figure out. Um, the worst thing, and, and this was a problem for me for a while, was the feedback mechanism that we had. I knew this first six months that I was working, um, I had no idea how I was doing. I thought I was going to be fired like the next day. You know, simply because the way we had been operating was like, if no one talks to you, that means you're doing perfectly fine. And for some people, especially like me, that just makes me super stressful. Because I'm like, if no one's talking to me, then what the fuck's going on, right? Am I doing well? Am I not? Like, you're always stressed all the time. And, and being stressed about that is not, it's not going to benefit the company either, right? Because all you're worried about in the back of your mind is like, am I doing a good job? Am I doing a good job? So, but the other problem is, you know, you don't want to have like a very traditional way of doing performance reviews, right? Like you don't want to sit down and have a piece of paper that your manager writes and like they check off like one through five, like have you been effective? Are you communicating well? Like that's, that's not really beneficial to us either. And so we've been playing around with that. You know, we've been trying to do team feedbacks where the entire team tries to give feedback to each other. Something that's more on an ongoing basis so that, you know, it's not something that happens on a quarterly basis. You know, if there's something that someone on your team notices that's going poorly, you know, they, they tell you like at that time that, hey, you know, maybe your communication is a little like, you know, dense or a little abrasive, you should think about that. Or like, you know, maybe you're writing your code in a certain way that the entire team doesn't really do. So, you know, people have to tell you like, oh, this is a style that our team adopts, you know, so it would be beneficial for you to do it this way so that the rest of the team isn't having to kind of figure out what you're doing. So th those are things that I know we're trying to figure out and it's very hard because obviously, you know, every individual prefers feedback in their own way, right? Some people don't like the idea of like having their entire team give them feedback in a, in a group setting, that's stressful. So some people want to have it in an individual one-on-one -on -one situation. Some people don't want their manager to talk to them, so they have to have HR do it. So we're, we're trying to figure it out, but it, it's definitely a problem. And if you look at families, it's not something they have to worry about either, right? Like, 
having feedback there is like you just kind of know like you're not going to get fired. Like your family's not going to fire you from your business. I mean, that would be that would actually be horrible. Like you would have to be doing a really really bad job for your actual family to tell you that like you're not working here anymore. Um, so like I said, the the other thing that I think is important are core values. Um, but the interesting aspect of core values is you know when people think of values and philosophies. Um, they obviously think that equals culture. Um, and culture is, it, it isn't something that's set in stone, right? Like, it's an emotional thing, it's a thing that's always growing. And so trying to, try, me trying to stand here and tell you that like, oh, your culture and your value should be X, Y, and Z, that's, that's not something I'm gonna do, and that's not something I should do, right? Because the fact is the culture is gonna be something that the people of the company are gonna create, right? Like, the people that you work with are gonna help you figure out what the right culture for the company is. You know, it will be established by the founders, right? The CEO, the CTO, all, all those people, they're gonna have an idea of what the culture is when they started, but the fact is things are gonna change over time, right? Like for, like I said, for us, feedback wasn't a problem when it was five or 10 people because you were always talking to each other, right? You knew if something was going on or if something was bad, but when you get to hundreds of people, it's a very different thing. And, and so now part of our culture has to be, how do we give feedback? What's the way of giving feedback? And that's something that we have to adopt now. If we had something set in stone from the beginning, feedback wouldn't even be something we would think about, right? Because it wasn't a problem for the earlier employees, so why should it be a problem for us just because we're 200 plus people? So obviously, like I said, if you look at Warburton's, if you look at Beretta, those, like it wasn't the fact that it was just the family that was running the business, like it, it, those people had to actually have a desire to work in the bakery, to work for a company that was making weaponry for hunters and, and militaries, right? Like they, they still had to actually want to do what they were doing because if they did it, they would just essentially be forced into this business that they didn't care about and that's how like a business dies, right? When you have people working there that don't have a desire, that don't have a passion about what they do, they're gonna basically run the business to the ground because they're not gonna care about what's going on. They're just gonna do what makes sense then and they're gonna continue doing that until it doesn't make sense anymore and the company just dissolves or they sell it and they move on and they either you know live their life on an island somewhere or go do something that they actually enjoy. So even though you know these families, like it was a family business, it was kind of understood that you were gonna get into it, none of these families, Beretta or Warburton's actually forced their children to work in the family business. They had, they were told that, you know, if they didn't want to do it, they didn't have to. They could go do what they wanted to do and that the parents would support them in that because they knew that if they forced their children to work somewhere where they didn't want to, that the business wasn't going to prosper anyways. So why bother doing that? Why bother having their children hate them and then work in a business that, that, that was going to die, right? Like if, if they realized that their children were going to do it, then maybe they would take a path that was going to either sell the company or do something else that would at least keep the company alive and, and keep their name alive and you know figure things out from there. The other thing that I, that's interesting, if you look at Valve, Valve actually, their handbook got leaked, and they have this idea of what they call cabals. And essentially, it's, it's having teams rather than just like a, a hierarchical structure. What they do is that people group themselves together with individuals that they either enjoy working with or individuals that have the same passion and desire as them, and then they work on something, right? For us, you know, the internal tools that we have, that was actually more grown like organically, as well as some of the products we have. One, one example is um, the GitHub for Mac product was actually a very organic product that came to be. We had two people at the time that were Coca developers, and they realized, you know, looking at Google Analytics, that there was like a large majority of Mac users are coming to GitHub.com, and the idea was okay. Like you know, yeah, we have a lot of experienced Git users that are coming, and they probably use the command line. But what about like the other people that they're working with, right? Project managers, their quality assurance people. Maybe those people are very comfortable in the command line. We should think about making a GUI client for them. So they made a prototype. They pushed it up. It was like a staff only thing. They got some. You know, and people were like, oh yeah, this is a good idea. And they basically 
internally were selling the idea to other developers that they wanted on their team. And they grew a team, they got four people, and then the product, you know, the prototype came a little, you know, became like a beta product. Then we realized that like that team needed more Mac developers, so we processed, we went through the hiring process and got three more people. And that was that was all organic, right? It wasn't a mandate that came down from our CEO or CTO to start the company and to to start like a Mac client, right? It was something that individuals in the company thought was important, and then they turned it into a reality. Another thing that I think is important is that it shouldn't really matter where you're working from, um, whether it be in the office or anywhere in the world. For us, in the, you know, we don't we have an office in San Francisco, but you don't have to like you don't have to sit with your team, right? Like if you if you're an individual that likes quiet. You know, we have a few rooms, you can go sit there. If you like noise, there's room with music, you can sit there. The idea is like, you shouldn't have to be forced to be anywhere, right? And that's why, you know, at Gitto, we all, about 70% of the company is remote. You can work from anywhere you want, as long as you're working on, you know, what, what you say you're gonna work on, as long as you get what you say you're gonna get done, that's all that really matters, right? Like we, you know, the idea is, is that as a, as a company, we have to kind of adopt this mentality that, you know, because that's something that is a value and a philosophy of the company that, you know, when I ask Scott or someone for, you know, hey, can you look at this security thing for me? I have to also realize that because we have this idea that you can be wherever you want, work from wherever you want, that like, it might take him 24 hours to get, to get my question answered for me, right? But that's because, that's okay because the company and the people at the company understand that that's something that, that's part of the company values and philosophy. So, you know, the time difference, like right now I'm in France, my, most of my teams in San Francisco, they understand that when they ask me to look at something, that's gonna take me a little while, right? Like I'm gonna get to it a little later than I would when I was in San Francisco because we were sitting across from each other. And you know, it, it's definitely a problem and some, some companies might think that that's not a good idea, but the way we see it is that we want to hire the best people that you know we can. It doesn't matter where they are. The fact is, people are going to have restrictions, right? You're going to have a spouse who's trying to get their PhD, and they're going to have to move to a city because that's a school that they got into. And if you're restricting them to stay in your city because that's where the office is, you know what are they going to do, right? They're going to have to make a decision, and you don't want to put one of your employees in that predicament because most likely they're not gonna pick you over their spouse. And now you're gonna lose an uh, amazing developer that was doing great work for you only because you know one rule that you had was that they had to stay in the city. You know, th those are things that, at least for us, we don't feel is important, right? We feel that having the right people, letting them work from wherever they want, that's what allows us to keep a successful business and people working for our business that are actually good at what they do. Another thing that a lot of these, uh, that we have as well as family businesses have, um, ask for forgiveness, right? You're never, you're never told what to do, you never ask, you actually have to ask to do something. You're basically told, do the right, do the thing that you think is right. And if it happens to go bad, you know, just be like, ah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't think that was gonna happen. I thought there was gonna be another outcome, you know, I wasn't trying to be malicious in any way. Like that, that's, that's a value that's very important, right? Because that's, what encourages risk-taking and innovative thought, right? Like when you know that if you do something and it happens to go extremely poorly, no one's gonna think that you're trying to, you know, take the company down or do something malicious. You know, they're gonna realize that, well, like there was a reason you did this for whatever reason, some research that you did, or there was a group in the company that thought this was a good idea. So they took, they took risks, right? And sometimes, sometimes it's amazing, right? Sometimes you're gonna come out with an amazing product that everybody enjoys working on, that everybody thinks is beneficial to the company. And sometimes you're gonna do something that everybody's like, what the fuck is that? Why did you even spend like two or three days on it, right? Like for us, we have a lot of products that have been staff shipped that no one outside of the company has seen for the light of day, right? There were some things that I thought were amazing, but then no one else but like me was using it, right? We're like, well, okay, if there's like one or two people using this product, it's probably not a good idea for us to release it to the general public, so we're just gonna kill it, right? And it's not like that individual developer now got fired because they spent a month on this 
feature that they thought was cool, right? Like the idea was, well, there was a reason they worked on it. They had a pain point. They thought maybe other people would have that pain point, and they they tried it out, right? And and that's something that should be encouraged, right? Because that's how you come up with cool new ideas, cool new features that are going to hopefully bring more customers to your product. So from that from that kind of idea thinking, you know, for GitHub, we call it first principles. I know other companies call it, you know, other various things. But the the fact is, is that we try not to just like look at a problem and figure out like what's the best solution to fix it, right? It's like, oh man, we need to support ticketing systems. So what's the thing that everybody else uses? Or you know, oh, we need a place to host our source code. So what's everybody using? Oh, SourceForge. We should just go use that, right? Like that's not something. That we try to do, we try to think from okay, if this, if there was no product around, like what would we do? And sometimes the answer is that there's actually a third-party tool that is way better than we could ever think of doing, and, and we're going to use it, right? But sometimes maybe there isn't, and then there's a team that gets together and builds an internal product and uses that, and that's something that you know benefits the company in a better way because you know it integrates with the rest of the company and the rest of the tools. Um, one example being we have an internal support ticketing system, and that was because we didn't believe any of the tools out there benefited us in the right way. And now it's actually used by the entire company. The sales team uses it. The support staff uses it. Everybody uses it. And the best part about it is that it integrates with all our other tools. So it's like very, very useful. Like it integrates with GitHub. It integrates with all the in other internal tools we have. So you're always aware. Of what's going on, and, and that benefits us as well as our customers because now, whenever any inquiries come in that the support staff needs help on by the developers that just push that feature release out, or the security team because there's some problem going on, it's very easy for you to just ping those individuals, and those individuals can see like an email or some notification come in within the medium that they're used to using, and then come in and like help out, right, and get the answer. Uh, quickly answered for our customers and try to give it the best experience we can to our customers. And that was essentially because we were allowed to look at the initial problem, which was how do we kind of handle support from a way that like benefited us, rather than let's just figure out the easiest solution and move on to the next problem. So work on what you enjoy and what matters. Um, the fact is, if, if you don't enjoy what you work on, and if you don't work on something that benefits the company. You know that's going to be a problem. The fact is, like you know, it, it has to be a balance, right? You could enjoy working on like you know robotic stuff, but if you're working for a, a web company, it's probably not a good idea for you to spend your time on like hacking on Arduino stuff and 3D printing. So obviously, you have to find a balance, right? It's not just like free for all. Work on what like you truly enjoy. The idea is work on something you enjoy that also benefits the company and that matters to the company. So a, a few examples are Steam, right? This was a product that Valve was working on, and the, and the funny part was they originally approached companies like Microsoft and Yahoo to do this for them, and those companies were like, "Oh, like a distribution network for games? Like we don't have time for that stuff. Like that doesn't make any sense for us." So then there was a team at Valve that was like, "Well, we need this. This is very important. Like, like if we want to iterate on our." Like releases for video games. If we want to send out patch releases, like in a very quick way, you know, we want this like distributive network. So a few people got together. They hacked out like a very beta version of Steam, and now it's like the most innovative platform out there, right? Like everybody puts their games on there. Like like big games, indie games, all of them are things like Steam.、Um, a few other things that we worked on was Hubala and Boxin. You know, those were things that we realized with Hubot. You know, rather than giving everybody credentials, why don't we just give this robot a credential and let everybody interact with it from chat, so that we don't have to worry about like, okay, if someone's laptop gets stolen, like we have to remove all of these like tokens and keys and anything like that.、Um, Boxin, that was something that we did because you know we felt that like we want to get everybody's laptop up very quickly. Um, things like pages, you know, everybody wants to host their blog, their static site. You know, why not host it on GitHub? We can make it really easy. Jekyll is a really easy tool to use, so so we looked into that. There was a team that was really into 3D printing, and a lot of people were hosting their STL files on GitHub, and all you could see was like you know the name .stl. So the idea was like, why not render those? 
And now they're rendered, you can see diffs, tons of people are using it for that. And that was essentially just like, people thought there was a need because there were customers using it as well as them. And so they went around doing that. Um, so the fact is, you know, like if there's anything you take away from my talk, you know, these are the three things you should think about. You know, make sure you work with the people that you enjoy working with, people that you trust, respect, and care about. You know, have values, instill values early on, but they'll, they'll you know, instill them in stone, right? Like it's not important for you to write the values all over your walls so that people can read them. The idea is that like, you need to actually follow that stuff, right? Like if you're, one of your values is that like, you know, assume no malice, then when someone does something, don't believe that they're like trying to be malicious about it. And a good way of like, of noticing that is, you know, when new hires come on board and they see the CTO and the CEO and the current employees actually following these values, that's the way they're gonna instill it in themselves as well and so on and so forth. Those are the ways you keep values around for generations. I mean, then obviously, you know, make sure that you enjoy what you work on and make sure that the people you're hiring actually will, will enjoy what they work on, right? Like, the reason I say the hiring process is important is that, you know, just as much as it's for you to figure out whether that individual is right for your company, you want to make sure that, you know, they believe they're right as well, right? You want to really sit down and tell them what, you know, the job entails, what they're going to work on, make sure that, you know, what they believe it to be is actually what, what it's going to be because if they come on board and they realize that this is not what they were, you know, they thought they were coming into and they're not going to enjoy it, then they're either going to leave or they're going to stay around because it's a nice paycheck and, you know, they'll get certain things done, but not everything. So, I mean, if, if there's anything you take away from my talk, um, at least for me, you know, even if you don't take those three things away, the most important thing that I think that people should think about is the people. You know, I know the reason I love working at GitHub is that I enjoy working with my team and I enjoy working with the rest of the people in the company as well, right? Like, it, it's allowed me to really understand, you know, what's going on at the company and really feel like I can give input, right? When there's product decisions that are being made, you know, if I, if I agree with them or disagree with them, I, I don't worry about making my opinion known because I know those people respect me and they trust me and, and they care about me, right? So when I make an opinion, they're just not going to brush it off, right? They're going to take it seriously. So thank you. Um, and I don't know how many of you are students, but if any of you are, if you go to education.github.com, um, you can actually get a micro account. I think it's like five private repos for like as long as you're a student, I think a year or two after that. So yeah, thank you. Uh, so you mean hiring or figuring out the best person to work on something? Oh, uh, yes, hiring. Hiring? I mean, for us, it, it's taken time, right? Like early on, it was when we were like five, ten people, it was basically like, you know, oh, you worked with someone that you knew was the right person for the job, bring them on, and like, since we, like, all those five people that worked with that individual, they kind of knew. Um, but now that we're a little bit bigger, we, our hiring process, I mean, I don't even think I would get through the hiring process. Like, it's basically, you have phone interviews, and you interview them, or Skype interviews, we bring people in. So no matter where they are around the world, you know, if you're Australia, if you're in France, we'll bring you in for at least a day or two to interview with your team that you're gonna work on. Um, then you interview with people um, outside of your team, and the idea outside of the team is that like, that's kind of the value cultural interview, right? It's people that are maybe part of the team that you would auxiliary be working with. An example being, say you're coming in to work for the sales team. Um, you're probably gonna interact with the finance team a little bit, right? So we're gonna have someone from the finance team kind of inter interview you through like a lunch setting, see like if they get along with you, how do they feel like you kind of have the values and philosophies that like the company believes are important. You know, if you're a developer, we're going to have a designer interview you to see how well you work with the designer. Um, so the, it's it's definitely a long process, right? Like you go through a lot of things. But it, the idea is is that we're trying to interview you for the aspects that we think are important. 
right? What you're going to work on and who you're going to work with. And for us, like, you know, we don't really believe, like, the things that I always found irritating was, like, the companies that where their interview process was, like, please figure out how to sort this, like, algorithm and, like, like you know, like, big O notation or, like, all that stuff, right? Like, from an engineering standpoint, that's not what we care about, right? Like, we'll normally just have you dive into the code base and, like, pair program with someone, right? So we, because that's what we care about, like, we assume that you know the code, like, you know how to do Ruby development well, right? Like, that's something that we kind of figure out either through, like, the Skype interview or, like, like you know, we'll, we'll send you, like, some, like, snippet of code and, like, ask you to do that. So the idea is when you come to the office, like, we want you to sit down and work with someone and see how well that works. Any other questions? Yeah, so like one of the things that like people figure out when they start acting up that's kind of, at least for me, different is that like essentially everybody kind of has to be a salesperson internally at least. And what I mean by that is that, you know, if there's a new project that you want to work on or even a new project that you and another person want to work on, you essentially have to sell that idea internally. So it, it's difficult, right? Like you have to be good enough to convince the company or enough people that uh, this is a good idea. So the, the one of the, the like values we have is that no individual should be working on something by themselves. If you can't convince at least one other person that your project is a good idea, then it's probably not a good idea or like you need to work on your sales pitch internally, right? And then once, once you get one or two other individuals working on it, um, then at that point you can team ship it, um, so your team kind of works on it, then at that point you staff ship it, and then that staff shipping, that's kind of like I said before, was like, you know, if all of a sudden like no one in the company but you two are using it, okay, now now it's something that you have to reevaluate, right? Like, was it actually something that was important? Like, if no one in the company uh, is using your feature or your, your project, then again, maybe you have to reevaluate again, right? And those are kind of the steps that we have the individuals go through, right? It's like, okay, convince one person, then like go up to the next layer. And then finally, if you get enough people, all right, let's, let's try to release it to the general population. But even then, the, the fact is like, uh, at least for us, like we're still not worried about removing features. So like, I don't know how, how early any of you were on GitHub, but there's things like, you know, we used to have like the ability to like, essentially have an inbox and email people and realize like, that wasn't a good use for, for GitHub, right? Like, you should just be using email for that. So, you know, we just removed it, right? And that's not a typical thing to normally do at companies, right? So that, that's something that we have in place that even if you have a new project and it becomes successful enough to be released to the general population, you, should, you shouldn't be like, oh, now it's good, it's gonna be around forever, right? Like, you still need to think about it, maybe you still need to improve it. For us, the inbox turned into the, the notifications page. Right? Because that's what we realized was was actually the important part of our product. Any other questions? It's okay. All right, cool. Thank you guys. Thank you.